All right. I'm glad to be here today. Uh, this discussion, I've learned a lot already at this meeting. I've been working with toxic algae for a very long time, but not been working with their impacts on cattle for very long. So I'll be much interested in your re reaction to the information that I'll present today. Um, you might not uh, know blue-green algae by all of its different names. Uh, my mother in all likes to call it pond scum. Uh, a lot of people refer to it as blue-green algae, uh, but it's really cyanobacteria. Uh, these are a cross between bacteria and algae. They have the ability to photosynthesize, but they can also take up dissolved organics. And they can fix nitrogen, so they can take atmospheric nitrogen and fix it and use that even if there's not enough nitrogen in the water and be very productive. They're not modal, but they have the capability of floating up in the water column because they have gas vacuoles. So during the middle of the day, they'll come up to the surface and form that scum that you might have seen in ponds. Uh, and they do respond to nutrient inputs. This is pretty well established that nitrogen and phosphorus are a great way to make a palm pond bloom. And uh, some of the other chemicals and fertilizers can also stimulate the most harmful types of algae that you might get in a pond. Uh, the harmful types are those which can produce toxins. And in the freshwater realm, that's generally the cyanobacteria. I've worked some in marine systems, and there the culprits are dinoflagellates or diatoms. But pretty much in freshwater, uh, the concern is when you have blue-green water. And the toxins that they produce can affect different organs. Uh, primarily, we are concerned about those that affect the liver, um, but there's some that are, make nerve toxins. So those neurotoxins can kill dogs and cattle outright pretty quickly. Uh, the liver toxins can kill them pretty quickly, too, if they're high enough levels, but usually these are things that are, uh, these toxins are in the water in lower quantities that just affect animal health over the long term. But there are some microcystins, which are fairly common at infecting the liver. The anatoxins or neurotoxins affect the nervous system. Kind of a new actor, the cylindrospermopsins are uh, known to affect the liver, but they also have um, some cancer-causing ability. And uh, these are some of the species that can make these uh, dangerous toxins. The most common are called Annie, Fanny, and Mike, uh, for short, Anabina, and Phanazomenon, and Microcystis. These are probably most typical bloomers in uh, farm ponds and other detention ponds. So as I said, um, there's a concern if you have very high levels that if animals drink the water or if humans are exposed to that water, that they would die, die outright from a single dose. And those levels are pretty high. For cattle, that would be 50 parts per billion in the water um, from consuming it for one day and dying. But even a level as low as 0.9 parts per billion, if they're exposed to that over time, that could cause liver damage. So anything above that would um, make you think you might be concerned about letting cattle use that water for drinking. Um, I list the microcystins first. The anatoxins are confusing because even at, uh, at the same levels that they might be able to sustain over the long term can have an acute effect. So this is the most common uh, cyanobacteria. This is the one we run into the most. And microcystis originosa is also very likely to be producing toxin when it's present. So it's the most common cyanobacteria, and it's the, got the most common toxin, microcystin. And this is in a lot of drinking water reservoirs uh, in China. If you look at a Google map, you can see that their entire uh, drinking water reservoirs are completely filled with this species, um, causing a lot of concern for human consumption. Um, another one, this is the fanny or phanazomenon flossaque. This one can produce the neurotoxins and the liver toxins. It occurs in ponds and reservoirs, but it can even occur in flowing waters. Um, and it looks sort of like grass clippings in the water, uh, if you've seen this before. And the final one I'll show an overview of, picture of, is anabina. And this one produces very potent uh, neurotoxins. And it is 
it's kind of a teal color in the water. I don't know if you've ever seen what looks like spilled paint on the edge of a pond or reservoir. Um, when it's very dense, that's, that's the, what it looks like in the water. And this newest, what used to be considered more of a tropical species, Cylindrospermopsis rasaborski, it produces Cylindrospermopsin, which is a liver toxin or maybe cancer causing. And this is showing up in Indiana and Michigan and some areas very much further north than we expected it. And we documented it in a number of uh, Georgia farm ponds this summer. Um, the last species that is known to produce uh, dermal toxins and some liver toxins is this Lingvia woolii, which does pretty well in flowing systems because it's benthic. It's a very thick sheath, so it's very difficult to kill even with copper compounds. So this one tends to hang around, especially in where you have a lot of phosphorus loading for a very long time. All right, so as I said, I've been working with algal toxins for a while, but just this past summer um, when we had some cattle deaths, uh, we started looking uh, closer to home at some of the farm ponds around Georgia. Uh, we had a, a veterinarian suggest to Bill Atkinson that he ought to have his pond water tested because it looked terribly green. Um, he had three cattle die before we even got a chance to look at the water. Um, and he had uh, a lot of uh, clinical signs of, of cyanotoxicosis, but of course these could be uh, signs of a number of other illnesses as well. And I guess I want to point out at, at this point that if animals are exposed to cyanotoxins, it's another stressor that might affect their health that could be impaired by some other um, pathogen or disease as well. Um, but they were very lethargic, and they had extreme weight loss. He did have a lot of bloody diarrhea, and he lost uh, three cows. And they were giving veterinary care to a fourth um, when we got uh, notified of this condition. So this was a small agricultural runoff pond. Um, he was using some poultry litter to fertilize the fields surrounding the pond. And the cattle were allowed unrestricted access to the pond. Unfortunately, this might not sound like a very good idea to those of you in this room, but this is a fairly common process, process of taking care of cattle in Georgia still. There's a lot of small farmers that still use this scenario um, to raise their cattle and water them. So we went out and identified and counted the algal species um, with microscopy. And then we have some test strips that we can just see whether or not they Toxin is at a danger level right in the field, but then coming back in the lab and using the ELISA kit, we can get a more accurate estimate of the amount of toxin that's in the water. Um, so we had over a million cells per mil, which would be of concern, of course. And in the field test, there was higher than five parts per billion microcystin, which is above the level that we would be concerned about for a, sub, for a subchronic dose. But the acute dose of uh, 50 parts per billion would probably have been enough to kill them, and we had double that. Well, triple that, actually, if I do the math right. And when you get to that dense of a bloom of cyanobacteria, it's really hard to get rid of. Um, as you might expect, we had extremely high phosphorus loading in this pond. And so with that continued productivity bump, uh, we still had, even with putrine applications, a number of times, we still had very high density of microcystis aeruginosa in this pond. Um, with the help of a little rain and a little bit more chemical application, we started to see a little more beneficial algae by June. But the last time we were out there, we still had a bloom in this pond. So when you get to this point, then I think we have to look at phosphorus reductions. Or you're going to have a continuing cycle of even if you could kill the algae, it's going to reappear with that level of nutrients in the pond. So we actually got uh, quite a bit of media about this particular pond because Bill Atkinson was a politician in Gwinnett County, and he was concerned and wanted to let some of his neighbors know about this. And so we started getting calls from throughout Georgia about other people who were looking at their ponds and seeing how green they were and, and finding sick cattle. So we started responding to this even though we weren't really set up uh, to do this investigation. So we uh, managed to screen preliminarily some samples from uh, throughout Georgia. And we would do the microscopy on them first to see whether or not it warranted um, doing the toxin assays with them. 
But unfortunately, most of the samples that people were sending to us were uh, that we did find that we had toxic algae in them. So we were able to, in this preliminary investigation, look at 14 different ponds. 11 of them did have that most common species of microcystin, uh, microcystis present, and the microcystins were present in seven of the nine that we tested. Um, and this is throughout Georgia, and throughout Georgia last summer, we were in a pretty heavy drought, and so we think that probably exacerbated the situation. It might also be a case of we were informed about these cases because we got some media attention, because people started to look at that and notice the, the um, correlation between their animal health and the drinking water source they were giving them. Um, but in any case, we think this is something that can become more prevalent in the future, certainly with the concentration of our water resources and pulses of rain uh, exacerbating nutrient runoff into these systems. So um, while we probably had a fairly extreme drought conditions last summer, we would expect to see more of that in the future and probably we'll see more algal blooms associated with that in the future. Um, unfortunately, I just want to mention that uh, even though it doesn't seem like cattle would want to drink uh, water out of, of a pond that has some toxic algae in it, they don't even mind it. In fact, dogs and cattle both have been shown to have almost an affinity for eating the scum on the edge of it. There must be something about it that tastes good to them. So some of um, California's health recommendations are actually increased because they know that the cattle and dogs are actually attracted to the scum. So it turns out that they're picking the highest concentration of toxin to consume. So the management recommendations I think you all would be quite familiar with. I think the first thing we would say is please fence the cattle out of this pond. And I think one of the reasons Mark Reese wanted me to come and be more involved in this group is that he has sometimes has trouble convincing farmers that that's a good idea, but when they're losing their cattle, hopefully this will be more of an incentive to do so, because uh, certainly it's difficult when you get to the point where this pond was to do much about it. But obviously, some of the things that uh, y'all would recommend would help reduce the, the phosphorus and nitrogen loading into these ponds and help reduce the amount of cyanobacterial bloom concerns. Um, certainly, we would recommend that in fields that don't need that kind of phosphorus application, to not use the poultry litter that is so rich in phosphorus to maybe spend a little extra money for those um, uh, nutrient applications which would only add the kind of uh, nutrients which the fields really require. Unfortunately, the poultry litter is inexpensive and commonly used and does tend to increase the phosphorus loading unnecessarily. So um, there has been some work with algicides in these ponds, but I, I can't say that I would recommend that in any way in a long, as a long-term solution since it's kind of a vicious cycle. If you've still got that nutrients in there, it will rebloom again. Um, so many uh, farmers are still relying on, on these ponds for their watering, so there needs to be a way that they can be encouraged to water the uh, cattle off-site. And we certainly don't want them to decide that it'd be a better idea to water them in the creek nearby. So neither option is a good way to turn. We want to convince them to fence the cattle out of these waterways. So um, as I said, we didn't have uh, funding to initiate this project. So since that time, we're partnering with the folks. Uh, a lot of folks from the Cooperative Extension Service in Georgia have been working with us to get us samples. And we're working with the folks at the Soil and Water Lab at University of Georgia, and they're doing all the nutrient analysis. So we can add that layer of now telling them what the algae are and what the toxin levels are so that they can have a sort of a holistic approach to their farm pond management. And we're trying to talk to more of the farmers around Georgia about our concerns with this. So this allows us to um, give them some information they might need and talk to the farmers directly about some alternative management strategies. And we've had a lot of folks that we've started working with on this project that have been very knowledgeable. Dr. Lee Jones is going to be working with us over the next summer to help collect some more tissues from the cattle so that we can validate that connection between the toxicosis and the animal health. And then some of the other folks that with Extension have been very useful in connecting us with the farmers that do need our help. 
Um, I want to particularly acknowledge uh, Dr. Rebecca Haney, who is my postdoc on this project and who has really co coordinated most of the work on this project. I just uh, last week got a, our first sample in from the summer from this pond out here, past your house, out in <laughs> past Oconee County. But you can see the little cattle in the pasture with open access to this pond, which you can already see on the Google image, has a nice blue-green bloom on it. 